these years. <laughs> no, we serve a mighty God that his blood still is working. 2,000 years later, people are still being rescued just because of his blood on Calvary. Oh, that's good news today. Amen. Amen. God in heaven, Lord, we just want to thank you for your sacrifice today. Lord, I pray that we will continue to submit our lives wholly to you so that your blood can cover us each and every day of our lives. Lord, we pray that you'd open your word to us on today. In Jesus' name, amen. Many of us are familiar with the quote, you have to crawl before you walk. <laughs> the quote describes a stage of development of a child prior to learning how to walk. This quote is really a modern day proverb which simply means that whenever we are trying something new, that it will take time before you're really good at it. In other words, you have to practice and work at it. You know, I can remember when my two younger sons were learning how to walk, or I should say trying to walk. Both of them tried to skip the stage of crawling and get right to walking in an attempt to keep up with their older That's brother. Right. Right. I actually remember Landon, when he first tried to walk, he actually tried to run. <laughs> That's how bad he wanted to keep up with his brother. When learning to live, how to live as Christians, we often skip a very important stage in the Christian journey. It is a stage that, call, that Paul calls sitting. Mm. Mm. We so desperately want to do what's right. We want to follow Christ's example that before we walk, before we even learn how to sit properly, we try to walk. Really, for the Christian, the phrase should not be, you have to crawl before you walk. It should really be, you have to sit before you walk. The only practice that we need, the only thing we need to work on is learning to sit down in Christ Jesus. Yes, Sitting. I want you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. The title of my sermon today is Glorious Grace. And I want to read verse 6, and we're going to start here, and we're going to look at a couple passages this morning just for a few moments. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 says, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Here Paul unfolds for us the most important stage of our development as Christians. And that is learning how to sit. What Paul is simply saying to us is that we must learn to rest in all that Christ has accomplished before we can begin to walk. Amen. I'm going to unpack this for us today. Amen. In other words, the key to walking in Christ and having a deep abiding relationship and a connection with him begins with knowing and believing what Christ has accomplished on our behalf. Amen. 
That is a critical teaching. This truth is foundational to the Christian experience. Without a proper foundation, then whatever life we try to live, no matter how sincere our efforts and how strong we and how hard we try, our attempts to master the Christian life will always be an exercise in futility and it will end in utter ruin. There is only one foundation that a Christian must build his life on, and it is the rock, Christ Jesus. That's why Jesus says in the parable at the end of Matthew when he saw the two builders, one wise and one foolish, he says the house that was able to last and weather the storms of life was the house that was built on the rock. If we don't build our Christianity, our life on Christ, then it will be just like building on sand. And when the storm comes, we will be washed away. To build on a foundation on ourselves or on our religion, no matter how right it is, is really to build on sand. This is where many Christians fail in their Christian experience. We fail to understand the true scope and understand the true scope of Jesus' work on the cross of Calvary. And we have not learned what it means to rest in all that Christ has done. In other words, we are like a two-year-old trying to skip a key stage in our Christian development because we want to walk so badly. This is the most critical teaching to our Christian experience. If we want to experience true life in Jesus Christ, we must learn what it means to rest and to sit in him. Our desire to walk before realizing, hear me now, our position in Christ Jesus reveals that we want the fruits of the life of Christ more than we want Christ himself. You see, many of us, we are more focused on what we should do and how we should live, and we want the fruits of righteousness, but more than we want Christ. And we do not understand, in order to bear fruit, we must first have Jesus. We must first know who he is and understand the scope of his work, all that he has done and accomplished on our behalf. See, the truth is, many of us, we view Jesus like training wheels on a bicycle that one day we will finally be mature enough to take them off and ride all by ourselves. And the twisted, and the, I shouldn't say twisted, but the unfortunate thing about it is that many of us believe that this is the goal that Jesus has in mind with us as well, that, he, that he's with us, that he's training wheels, and at some point he wants to take himself off so that he can watch us walk without him. Are y'all with me today? And we believe that that is Christ's goal. And because we're trying to walk on our own, we never truly experience the the work of Jesus Christ. We never really end up walking worthy because we have not yet experienced the security in what Christ has accomplished. I want you to understand something, that this is so important that Paul spends the first three books of the book of Ephesians talking about what Christ has accomplished for believers. In chapter 1, verse 3, I want you to go with me there. He says, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us 
with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so he begins the book by talking about all of the heavenly blessings that we have received in Christ Jesus. But then he goes on to unfold for us the scope of what Jesus has done. He starts revealing to us in the entire book what it means to receive every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. In verse 7, which is which was our scripture reading today, he says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And the first thing I want to talk about here today is that in him we have redemption through his blood. In other words, we have been set free from the powers of darkness. You see, before we met Jesus Christ, we were slaves to doubt. We were slaves to Satan. We were without God in the world. But because Jesus shed his blood on Calvary, because he was willing to give his life, you and I have been set free. And Paul wants us to know that this is an accomplished fact. This is true, and there's nothing that we can do about it. Here is the challenge, is that many of us think that even though we have been set free, even though we have been delivered, that there comes a point in the Christian experience where we need to be re-delivered. And whenever we feel that we need to be re-delivered, we are saying that we do not believe that what God accomplished in Christ is enough. For example, the children of Israel, when God delivered them from Egypt, um, all 600,000 of them, they never even lifted a finger and they walked out without any hindrances to them leaving. And so they start marching on their way to the promised land and they come to a Red Sea and there is Pharaoh behind them and they start doubting their deliverance. Mercy. Mercy. And so they start cursing at Moses and saying, what should we do? It would have been better off that we stayed in Egypt. They thought that God's deliverance back in Egypt was not final and enough to keep them while they're standing on the borders of the Red Sea and Pharaoh's mighty army coming to kill them. They thought they needed to be re-delivered. And what Moses says, stand still and see the salvation of God. And so sometimes our feelings tell us that we really haven't been delivered. Or sometimes other people tell us that we really haven't been delivered. Or sometimes we fall into sin and we start believing that we have not really been delivered. But I want you to know today that it is a lie from the pits of hell that you have been set free in Christ Jesus. You don't need to be re-delivered. You need to sit in what Christ has done. You need to rest in his finished work. But then he goes on to say, he says that um, you have, not only have you been redeemed through his blood, but he says that you have forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. In other words, he says you have forgiveness. You have been released. You do not have to, to try to earn God's forgiveness. You know, some of us, we think about our sins and we think it's so bad that we start thinking that our stuff is so bad, so heinous, so terrible, so dark, so sinister, that not even God will be willing to forgive us. But here we say, and the Bible lets us know that when we come to God in repentance and sorrow for our sin and a desire to turn away from our sin and acknowledge our sin, then we can claim Christ's forgiveness for our sins no matter how terrible and how dark they are. If he can forgive Moses who murdered somebody, surely he can forgive you. But then it gets even better. He says that his forgiveness is according to the riches of his grace. Hmm? Grace means gift, favor, kindness shown towards undeserved uh, kindness, undeserved favor. 
But he says, it's according to the riches, according to, he's, what he's saying is that God has an abundant supply of grace that he now pours out on us in lavish amounts. So you're not with me today. I don't know if some of you remember, um, you know, I'm going to date myself a little bit. If you remember the show DuckTales, some of you probably never watched that show. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. But it's a show called DuckTales. And in the show, there's a, a gentleman by the name of Scrooge McDuck. And he had a big money bin just full of just gold piled all the way up to the ceiling. And he was so intoxicated with his money that every now and then, every day, he would jump into his bin of money and swim around because he was excited of just how much he had. But I want to suggest to you today that that image, I, when I think about the grace of God, I think about it being like this big storehouse of just, of just bountiful grace that, that God is just storing up. But he's not just keeping it for himself. He wants to pour it out upon us. Notice what he says in verse 8. He says, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. And the word there for abound is lavished. Hmm? He says he lavished his grace on us. He, he causes it to overflow on us. He, he gives it to us more than, more than we should get or more than perhaps we really need. He's, he's not stingy with his grace. He spoils us with his grace. He keeps filling us with his grace because he understands that if he doesn't fill us and lavish his grace on us, that we would not even be able to recognize him. We would not be even have a desire to live for him and so he just keeps on pouring lavishing his grace on us I want to use an example today I want to imagine that this water is the grace of God and he just keeps pouring it pouring it on us right but even when it gets to the brim he he goes back into the storehouse and he and he pours he opens it up and and he starts some of y'all might get mad at me today but he starts pouring out his grace on us tell you something if he did not pour out his grace on us then we would not be sitting here today oh you're not with me today Paul says in Romans he says it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance the reason why you're here today why you even have a desire for him is because God was in heaven just pouring pouring out his grace God pours out his grace. But then he says, in verse 6, I want to close. This is my last passage here. He says in verse 6, he says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made accepted in the beloved. Here Paul reveals to us how grace comes to us, and who grace is. Oh, you're not with me today. Grace comes to us in Christ Jesus. And grace is all of God's riches in Christ. So when Jesus, why he says later, he says, by grace you have been saved. In other words, by Christ you have been saved. See, when he's talking about grace, he's not just talking, he's not talking about some power. He's talking about Jesus himself. So when he calls it glorious grace, he's talking about his son, Christ Jesus. So when we receive Christ in our lives, we are receiving all of the riches of God. Yes. That's why he provides for us every single thing that we need yes. in order to live for him. Amen. Amen. I love what the songwriter says. He says, grace, grace, God's great grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace Grace that greater. is greater. greater. Oh, you're not with me today. Then all I was saying, he's talking about Jesus. Jesus cleanses deep within. Jesus is greater than all our sins. And when we receive him, we receive the grace of God. And we receive 
the power yes. to live for him. Yes. 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 I want to close with this. And we started, I started off by talking about sitting. He says, we have been seated Come on now. in heavenly places. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. This is the starting position of the Christian. Come on now. With all your weight on what Christ has done. Yeah. 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 Trusting in everything that he has done. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to lift a finger to accomplish redemption and forgiveness right. yeah. and grace. Yeah. Uh -huh. All you have to do is sit down yeah. 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 in Christ yeah. Jesus. Yeah. And hear me now. Yeah. When you know who you are in Christ, yes, sir. Yeah. then yes, he sir. releases the power inside of you yeah. so that you can get up yeah. and walk yeah. worthy yes, in Christ yes, Jesus. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We fail in our Christian journey because we do not understand, we do not sit yeah. in Christ. Yes, Before you can walk, mm -hmm. you must rest in what God has already accomplished. Righteousness. Amen. And he'll provide Mercy God. the righteousness. Amen. So that's what we're celebrating today. Amen. What Christ has done. Let's receive him today. Amen. Amen. Amen.